So I have the pleasure of introducing uh, this morning our wonderful Kevin. <laughs> our wonderful Kevin. Um, uh, this morning as I was getting ready to come here at, you know, 7 o'clock in the morning, I thought to myself, this is not why I got into this business, to be up on a Sunday morning. And, um, thanks, Diane. Uh, yesterday, we, were, we had a, a breakout session, actually, uh, the TCG staff here about uh, some of the internal work we've been doing on our uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And uh, we uh, were talking a lot about also a lot of the external work that we're doing and I have to say, Diane couldn't be in this session yesterday, but um, I want to say now, in front of everyone, none of the work that we are doing on any front would be possible without the leadership of Diane over the past several years. And your impact on the board and on our field are, are deep and wide ranging, and we are so grateful to you. All right, it is now my pleasure to welcome our next speaker to the stage. David Evan Harris is a sociologist, artist, and curator. He's the research director for the Institute for the Future and the executive director and founder of Global Lives Project. His work has been featured at the Smithsonian, United Nations University, and Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. And he has presented at and consulted with organizations that range from Apple and Google to the White House Council on Environmental Quality and the Office of Management and Budget. Please join me in welcoming David Evan Harris to the stage. Um. Welcome. It's, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, so it's, it's the morning um, on the last day uh, of this conference, and, and I want to start by doing something that at the Institute for the Future we call orienting to the future. And um, this is going to be uh, your chance to do something um, that, that will put you into the space of thinking deeply, not just about next year or the next two years, but we're, th we're talking about the next five, 10, 20 years here. And um, the way this is going to work is uh, that depending on what I put on the screen, you're, you're going to physically uh, move um, as you are able with your bodies to one side of the room uh, or the other, and um, but I, I, what I need you to do is something that you've probably all wanted to do uh, many, many times, which is rush the stage right now. No, I need you really to stand up and rush the stage. It's time. Okay, come on up. And as you're coming up here, um, you're going to move to the left if you identify as deeply fearful about the future. One, two. I, one, two. Thank you. And if everyone can't fit on the stage, it's okay to be in the first couple of rows. Make, make some room if you're, you're on the stage. We've got other people here. All right. So we, we have some deep... We have some deeply fearful people over here, and in the minority, I want to give them a voice. So tell, tell me in, in a few words, what makes you deeply fearful about the future? ISIS. Wow, okay, and, and you, sir? Netflix. Net Netflix. <laughs> wow, okay, make way, make way. All right, I'm coming through to find the most excited person. All right, Ra raise your hand if you're the most excited person about the future. Someone over here. Oh, okay, here we go. Why are you excited about the future? Um, because I think it's an opportunity for huge change, and I see, I see us heading in that direction. Great. Who else, who else is very excited about the future? I see you over here. Me? Yes. I, yeah, I, I mean, look at it. It's on this roll. We're on this roll. We're on a roll, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah, we're on a roll. I think we are. Um, this is great. Okay, and I'm going to find someone in the middle here. I'm going to run through. This is, okay, yes. I'm going to retire soon from my day job so I can spend more time being chairman of the board of our theater company. Yes. Excellent. Okay. This is a great, 
crowded group, and um, I, I appreciate you being here. So we're going to do another orientation, um, and again, we've got the, uh, the guide, the arrows up here on the stage. Um, so move to stage right if, in your current position, you feel empowered about the future, and uh, if in your current, uh, and helping your organization. Um, so, and then to stage left, if you feel disempowered about helping your organization. <laughs> oh. Quite like a crowd. You know, walk there. In front of the other. Oh, all right. Uh, there's some. There's some good empowerment in this room. Um, sir, you look. You look extremely empowered. Oh, I, I do. Yeah. Um, we're gonna. All right. If we could um, settle into our places. Tell, Okay, tell me, uh, tell me why you feel, shh, why you feel empowered about helping your organization. Um, I feel empowered to help my organization, A, because of the positioning my leadership gives me, um, but also because I'm, I have a lot of vision and a lot of energy and I have a lot of focus and I know my purpose. So all of that gives me empowerment. That's great. Okay, so someone else who feels really empowered in my, in my circle here. Uh, you're all theater people. One of you can share. <laughs> you have to choose. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I feel uh, empowered because we've got a lot of great ideas uh, in our company, and we have a lot of great enthusiasm for those from our board. Great. So they're they're selling us, which great. is great. Okay, and there are some disempowered people, and I, I'm going to symbolically represent your disempowerment by asking you to shout why you feel disempowered. <laughs> One of you over there, tell us why. Uh, okay, well, um, the structure of my organization is such that I have a lot of responsibility, but not that much authority. Mm -hmm. um, and so, oh, yeah. I literally don't have power. Wow. Uh, but, but you project extremely well with your voice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Okay, someone else over there who I can't see, shout it out. Why do you feel disempowered? My organization is reorganizing, so I am maintaining a transition. Oh, so that's kind of uh, like riding a skateboard downhill. Yeah, frightening. Okay, um, here is our next orientation. I think technology is bringing us closer together. Stay over where I am here on this side, stage right. And if you think that technology is pushing us further apart, move to stage left. Yeah, what, if, what, if it, what if you think it can bring us together? I think, it's, I think it's a good if, if you're in the middle, you should go to the middle. You it's might be in the middle. Uh -oh. yes. We're in the middle. Okay. I'll ask you to represent your views if you make it to the middle. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, th this seems to be the um, the most balanced so far. Okay, uh, Sarah, could you could you tell us why you're in the middle? Because I think it's really situational. Um, I think there's certain aspects of technology that really do bring us closer together and give um, empower um, information. Um, and there's lots of times where I feel like they they don't do that. They do the opposite of that. Who else wants to share why they're in the middle here? This, oh, okay. I think that technology is uh, allowing us to be creative in ways that we weren't able to be before, recording music, making films, et cetera, et cetera, and connect with each other in ways we weren't able to always do. But I think by the same token, it's isolating us, it's causing us to be antisocial, and it's, and it's pushing us apart. Yeah. I remember going into coffee houses 30 years ago and getting into conversations. Now you go in there, and everyone is connected to somebody far away. 
they're completely isolated in the space they're in. Yeah. Okay. I want to hear from someone on this far end. Um, oh, you're always on the farthest. Uh, but no. Uh, okay. <laughs> Emily, let's hear from you. Um, I, I think more and more, I, I remember writing letters and talking to people on the phone far more than I do now, and maybe that's uh, uh, more a statement on my own personal disconnectedness, but um, I think that is the trend overall. Many of my friends that are my age also have the same sort of issue. One, one, one of the others of you ready to share? Yes. I fear that technology is driving uh, income inequality. Mm. Yeah, strong point. Okay, someone who feels really strongly way over there that technology is bringing us closer together, shout it out. Why? Just tweet it. Just, oh, <laughs> <laughs> well put, well put. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, please, I see a hand. And we started using Google Docs and shared documents and creating budgets more quickly and easily together. We also started using Google Keep for meetings, which has been really very phenomenal in terms of just getting us to be more efficient in how we conduct ourselves as a, as, as a group of people. And then extending our, just in terms of my own family, which is dispersed across a couple of continents. You know, WhatsApp is something that we absolutely love and use a lot. And the sharing of photos and, and uh, and just very quick, swift, uh, staying close together using that technology has been really, really helpful. And uh, outside of that, uh, yeah, I didn't think it further. <laughs> wow. Oh, one more person in the middle here. But there's also the problem of people who are technologically challenged, <laughs> who can't understand all the technology are left out. And if you can't afford to get the education of the technology, um, then you don't participate in it. So you don't get to be a part of that community. So there's that whole group of people who are left out just because they don't understand it. Um, me. <laughs> so that's very difficult. All right. OK. So. Um, it's, it's early in the morning, but I want, um, I want to keep asking you two more questions. So I am a true risk taker. If, if you're a risk taker, go to stage right. And if you are risk averse, come over here to stage left. You wanted me to stop here? No, I no, don't. No, okay. <laughs> okay, the risk averse people didn't look that excited about sharing their ideas. So <laughs> I'm going to find a real risk taker. How about you, sir? Patrick. All right. Shh. We're going to hear from Patrick about why he likes to take risks. Uh, in terms of my personal future, I feel like. Um, the very fact that I'm investing in this field is a risk. Well put, well put. OK. And uh, Dean, risks. Well, I love the challenge of taking on risk and uh, making things happen. Excellent. Uh, one, oh, I have a handheld mic now. Um, another, tell us about your risks. Um, I've ridden a bicycle for 30 years in New York City, so that's one thing. <laughs> And also, you know, going into the theater, I always went where, with my heart where, where the writers that I love are, so. Great. And Sharon, why do you take risks? Well, um, I'm a founding artistic director of a theater company in Charleston, South Carolina, and I'm the mother of five children. Woo! Wow. 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 
Yeah. Figure it out. <laughs> Sounds risky. OK. Risky. Um, so improv hats on. Someone is going to ask a question of all of you in the audience. We've got some blanks on stage now. I know you are all very on your feet thinkers. Who, who is going to suggest to me one, uh, one question for the group? About risk? Uh, no, about anything. That you're about the future. Ideas about. Are you a complainer or are you, uh, optimi are you optimistic oh. or pessimistic? Are you op oh, I, guess I think we kind of started with optimistic or pessimistic. Let's get some others. Come on, some ideas here. What is it you really want to do but you're terrified of? Well, OK, well, that's, uh, I need a binary. I need a binary. Theater is going to be way bigger in 20 years than it is today. All right. If you think theater is going to be way bigger in 20 years than it is today, bigger. it is way bigger. Bigger or smaller? More people in attendance and revenue. Okay. Theater in general, or if you if you agree with this man's statement, go towards him. Exactly. Go towards this side of the room. And if you if you think theater is going to be smaller, go to that side of the room to stage left. That depends on theater as an art form. Yes. <laughs> I think he's, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, I think he's thinking so attendees there. Because I, I don't know if that depends on how the millions are going to fall. Right? You know, is it going to partner with charities? Is it going to partner with other organizations? Or if it doesn't do that, yeah. it won't evolve. Is there a good point? theater or theater in general? Um, theater in general. Okay, it, se it seems there's... Are you sure your mic I do. I have two mics. You have two mics. I'm in okay, is that Stacy? So Stacy is going to tell us um, her perspective on why theater is getting bigger. Well, I, I believe in you know our population is growing, and I think that you all are getting better at marketing marketing this great thing. So I, there, there's lots of reasons why it should get bigger. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, over here. You look scared. No. Um, <laughs> no. Okay. Tell us. Why is theater getting bigger? Yes. Um, I think as media um, grows, the need for the live interaction and the experiential ex experience, sorry to duplicate, um, is going to be more and more valuable. And I think if writing is, improves, um, theater will really improve. All right. Mm. Yeah. Theater as we know it, smaller. Theater as the future might bring it, larger, because theater is universal and timeless. That is, that's perfect. Um, thank you. That, that's actually a perfect segue towards what I would like to tell you all about. So if you could return to your seats. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> All right, thank you so much. Um, so, well, uh, you may wonder why I have a sign up that says, Welcome to California. Um, it was, yeah, oh, okay, Cal Californians in the audience, some hands here, okay. Oh, wow. Okay, great. Um, so, I, I believe it or not, I was in California only seven hours and 20 minutes ago. Um, and, uh, but here I am now. So, I am a reflexive, I, I am a reflexive sociologist. That is, that is my training. And what that means is that as a sociologist, I don't believe in objectivity. I think it's very important that we, uh, that we acknowledge the perspectives and the biases uh, that make us who we are and shape how we think. Um, so, I uh, grew up in California. I was born at this place. Um, Stanford Hospital, and I went to Mountain View High School. Uh, Mountain View, you may know today, uh, is the home of Google. Um, it, uh, Google moved in the year I moved out, and uh, I moved out to go not very far um, to Berkeley, the other, the other university um, on the other side of the bay. And you, you may know that there are certain things that um, Stanford and the Silicon Valley and Berkeley have in common. Um, one of them, I like to say, is that uh, 
nobody trusts you if you're overdressed in either location, um, <laughs> but for totally different reasons. Uh, so, it, but Berkeley, Berkeley was fantastic for me uh, because it, it, it had that entrepreneurial spirit of the Silicon Valley that I was used to growing up with, um, but it was so geared towards activism and towards making the world a better place and uh, all, you know, all of the things that I, that I really believed in. It, it had beliefs too. Um, and so during my time at Berkeley, uh, I, as was mentioned in my interview, I, I worked at the White House. I actually um, got an internship and I worked at the Council on Environmental Quality. Uh, I, I was very, um, a very rabid environmental activist, vegan, and uh, was very into the idea of uh, bringing my ideas to other people and, and making the world a better place. Um, I then, uh, when I graduated from college, I decided I really wanted to experience other parts of the world, and so I moved to Brazil. And this was my university in Brazil, the University of Sao Paulo, um, where, where I studied sociology. And then, um, after a little bit, I ended up uh, back in Palo Alto, strangely enough, at a place called the Institute for the Future. Um, this is one of my coworkers at a recent fashion show that we put on called Climate Change Couture. Um, and uh, the, ins the Institute for the Future is a, is a pretty exciting place. We get to think pretty far outside of the box. Um, and I want to show you this very short um, video that will tell you more. We're clearly living in a period of huge transformation, technological, social, economic. And while we can't know exactly what the future holds, that is, we can't predict the future, neither can we assume that today's choices and assumptions will still be relevant tomorrow. For over 40 years now, the Institute for the Future has helped governments, businesses, and nonprofit organizations to make sense of the emerging trends and disruptive forces that are transforming our world. Through various types of techniques, ethnographic research, expert workshops, collaborative online forecasts, and others, we help people anticipate the discontinuities and dilemmas that face us globally and at home, so that we can ultimately make better decisions. We create maps that communicate the patterns and connections in complex systems. We also create digital artifacts that immerse us in alternative future scenarios and make them more tangible. And we use massively multiplayer online games that leverage new skills to tackle global problems. With these and many other tools, our mission is to develop the foresight required to reveal the insights that allow for strategic action, both now and in the coming decades of disruption and uncertainty. So I want to linger on this image that came up in that video. So this is actually a drawing from 1964 by one of the founders of the Institute for the Future, uh, Paul Barron. And you can see in this drawing um, three types of networks. And he actually drew this when he was a researcher at the RAND Corporation. And, uh, and the group of people that started the Institute for the Future were four, uh, four people who left the RAND Corporation because they didn't want to do uh, the kind of work that actually um, allowed them to produce the, the thinking in this drawing. So this was all about designing a communications infrastructure for the United States that could withstand multiple simultaneous nuclear bomb uh, attacks. And so the idea is um, if, you, if you're in this centralized um, version of the, uh, of the infrastructure, um, you just drop one bomb and then no one can communicate anywhere, right? So if you go to the decentralized version, it's a little bit better, but uh, if five drop bombs dropped in the right place, um, then everyone else is still out of touch. Um, now the, the distributed, the idea of the distributed network of communication um, was very novel in the, in the 1960s, uh, but this was actually a really critical force in developing what we have today. Um, Paul Barron invented a, a technology called packet switching, um, which is one of the one of the uh, underlying technologies that makes the internet possible. It allows uh, packets of information to move from one node to another node to another node to another node in a network and, uh, and without necessarily needing to ever pass through a central node. Um, so, if the, so there is no center and that's how our internet works today. Um, so at the Institute for the Future, um, we, we say we like to do experiments on ourselves uh, to see if what we think is actually correct. So this is our org chart. 
Um, so it's, it's, it's not a tree, uh, it's actually a spiral. And at the center of the spiral is the executive director, um, also known as uh, primus inter pares, or first, first among equals. We also call her the decision maker of last resort. Um, she, only, she only makes decisions by herself uh, if the entire lead team around her cannot come to a consensus and, and agree on what the decision should be. Um, so then uh, to, to the outside of her, um, you see the program leaders, and then you see the project teams and the affiliates and Future Commons, which is a broader network, uh, our sponsors, and then the general public. And then you see these, these different colored uh, little interacting network, mini networks within the network there. Those are project teams. So you might um, be in one meeting in the morning, and the person who is your boss in the morning uh, ends up reporting to you in the afternoon, because the hierarchy is fluid like that. And so, so you know, someone may manage someone in one project, and that person may manage the other in the other one. So um, the, the her that I was referring to, our executive director, is Marina Gorbis. And, uh, and this is a book that she published in 2013 um, called The Nature of the Future, Dispatches from the Social Structed World. And um, in this book, she lays out a lot of her ideas uh, around this idea called social structing that I'll get into more. Um, so at, at the Institute, we talk a lot about the foresight to insight to action cycle that we work on. And so what, what, I'm, what I'm doing now, hopefully, is offering a little bit of foresight to all of you um, and the idea is that in, in this encounter that we have today, um, there, there may be some insights generated. And then you all go away and take action. And uh, that, that is the, the cycle. And then we, we keep coming back and we repeat that. And this is how we, um, we think systematically, we catalyze systematic thinking uh, about the future in the global community. That's our mission at the Institute. Um, so, Super uh, social structured organizations, uh, that's a little bit of a, a complicated term. I'm going to make it even more complicated by referencing uh, an economics paper from the 1930s. Um, is anyone familiar with Ronald Coase? No, ring any bells. I see one, one hand. OK, so um, Ronald Coase wrote uh, this piece called The Nature of the Firm. And he said, the, the main reason why it is profitable to establish a firm is the cost of using a price mechanism, AKA transaction cost. Um, so this is really, really important. Um, Maybe some of you have heard of this guy, Clay Shirky. Any, anyone familiar with Clay Shirky's work? OK, I see some more hands. Um, this, this book, Here Comes Everybody, The Power of Organizing Without Organizations, he takes um, Ronald Coase, this economist's idea, um, about, about the, um, the ceiling. And essentially what Ronald Coase was trying to get at was, uh, how big does a company get or an organization get um, for it to no longer be valuable to have it be one organization, that it should split into two. And Clay Shirky introduces this other concept, which is the Cosian floor, which is basically how many people or how, uh, you know, how much interest do you have to have in forming an organization for an organization to even be possible to take shape. And his argument is that social media technologies uh, and, and just technologies in general raise the floor for organizations even emerging, for groups of people to be able to communicate with each other. So all of a sudden, if you live in a community where you're the only person passionate about quilting, you may not have previously been able to have a, a meaningful relationship with other quilters. Um, but thanks to the power of social media like Facebook or, or, or Twitter or Pinterest, you can all of a sudden surround yourself all day, every day with other quilters, right? You can, you can have that relationship. And that is the raising of the Kosian floor. Um, so institutions are a technology and this technology is being disrupted very actively. Um, so I'm going to go back again to these three charts. So if you, if you want to update this to today and to thinking about organizations, you can think about it as um, the, the, the first version, uh, the centralized system, um, is uh, organizations are traditional, pr probably what a lot of organizations that you all work in look like. Um, there, there's a center and there's some nodes, but if that center were to go away, uh, it's unclear what would be left, right? Um, now, platforms are the next level up, um, and, and that's a reference to, um, to the distributed. And then social structured creation um, is, uh, it, uh, 
is the, the network, the idea that we can create organizations within the network. So defining social structing for you, um, creating value by aggregating micro contributions by large networks using social tools and technologies. Uh, so to try to illustrate that a little more, I'm going to uh, present this in what we call our two-curve framework. So this is, this is a way that we talk about um, the past and the future. And so the, the past, what we call the declining curve or the first curve, um, we could call institutional production. The second curve or, or the emergent curve is social structed creation. This is a different way of, of creating value, of shaping institutions. And you can think about this also, um, to, to take this metaphor a little further of institutions as technologies, you can think about uh, social structed work, meaning that management is, is like software. Um, to, to illustrate this, and think about this mechanic and um, you know what he's able to do here and you know one one person working on a car he can probably get a lot done it looks like he could fix your car um, but the alternative is something like this right and so we're talking about you know two seconds four seconds a bunch of people working in close coordination so this is a metaphor for the idea of the type of collaboration and the type of coordination that becomes possible when you have a dramatically lowered barriers to, to communication uh, between groups of people. Um, so one of, the, one of the elements of these emerging work ecosystems that uh, we're seeing around us um, is what we call algorithmic coordination. So um, algorithms are you know, the, the, the tools that allow us to allow machines to generate uh, all kinds of insights and solve problems for us. And I want to show you a few um, what we call signals at the Institute for the Future, signals of the future to come, things, things that are new and marginal today but might be um, extremely important or, or even become mainstream in the future. Uh, so magic is one example of this. Has anyone tried magic? I think it's in beta now. So. Um, so you can uh, you can just basically ask for anything. It's um, it's that's the whole that's the whole point of this app. And so can we get some Coca Cola in ten minutes? Uh, how about two liters for ten dollars? Writes back to you. And it just you, the the challenge is ask it for anything. Uh, can a helicopter pick me up right now? They'll they will charge you for it. Um, but uh, but that that's the idea. Um, so probably all of you are familiar with Uber and Lyft and all of these car um, different types of car services. Um, have any of you heard of Breeze? Anyone on this one? Okay, so Breeze actually, if you decide you want to start driving an Uber or a Lyft, um, is a service that allows you to very, very quickly lease a hybrid car and get driving right away. So it's an, it's an interesting take on um, bringing this one step further to get the resources to you that you need to do this. And again, this is uh, driven by algorithms uh, that coordinate this. Um, so this is a group of guys that have an offering, start an Uber for X today. They'll make you an Uber for whatever it is that you need. Um, recovery trucks, weed delivery, um, right? It, 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 strippers, yeah, tutors, mechanics. Um, so the, the idea is that the, right? Um, <laughs> Uber for X. Um, so, yeah, so I mean, this is pretty interesting to think about what it might imply in, in your field. So I, I, I encourage you to think about you know, what would be the X um, for you, single X, not triple X. Um, so um, so this, is a, this is another signal of the future um, called Good Gym. Has, has anyone heard of or, or, or participated in Good Gym? I saw a nod back there maybe, okay. So Good Gym. Um, how it works, community of runners who get fit by doing good. And again, this is driven by algorithms. So um, you may take on the task that you want to deliver a meal to an elderly person who can't leave their home. And so you log into Good Gym when you're gonna go for your run in the morning, and it tells you exactly where to stop to pick up that meal, and exactly where to bring it, and who you're gonna visit that day, and tells you who visited them last. And so it's using algorithms to do something um, com completely different from, uh, you know, from Uber or Lyft, but this, this is a, an example of how you can take these technologies and bring them into uh, a, a social or a social good type of space. Um, even is another really interesting one. So this is actually a platform um, for for freelancers or for micro workers, um, and it 
evens out your income on a monthly basis. Um, and so it, it, it manages your cash flow for you when you're working uh, on things like TaskRabbit or Uber or Lyft. Um, now, this, this is a really interesting sign of, uh, you know, of what's, what's changing in this new micro work economy. And there are a lot of problems with it. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about that because I really want us to take these ideas and bring them towards theater. But um, I'm going to talk a little bit more now about, about the arts and the idea of amplified individuals. So I, I'm sure all of you are deeply familiar with Kickstarter. Um, how many of you have heard of Patreon? OK, okay a couple hands. So let me show you. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators. Um, free space. Has anyone been to a free space or heard about free space? Yes. Okay. We have one in the back here. Uh, oh, two. Okay. So um, in, in San Francisco or somewhere else? You heard about it. Okay. If you, you went to the one in San Francisco. Okay. So. Oh, okay. Great. So free space. Um, very interesting uh, idea. It came from a guy named Mike Zuckerman, and he um, he goes by the other Zuck, uh, and he um, he had this opportunity to lease a building in San Francisco. I think it was around twenty thousand square feet for one dollar for a month, and he um, he decided he just wanted it to be a open space for creativity, community, and civic innovation. And so he, he opened it up. They um, no no alcohol or drugs allowed in the space, and I think that was the only rule. And so basically. Um, and then they made a wish list of things they wanted. They wanted musical instruments. They wanted paints. They wanted um, creative supplies. Within a couple of days, they had actually programmed out uh, dozens and dozens of events. It ended up being that during this one month period, um, there were more than 300 different events that took place in this free space. And it was all kinds of, uh, of creatives, of hackers, uh, performers. Uh, there, were, there were multiple performance art and theater related things that took place inside of free space. And it ended up being that it was so popular that when that $1 um, for one month lease ended, they went to, to Indiegogo and they raised enough money to actually lease the, the same space um, actually at a below market rate, but um, for a whole nother month because this community didn't want to didn't want to stop this. Um, but they decided after that month that they wanted to do other free spaces in other parts of the world. And so this free space movement was born and there was one that happened in Paris and then another that happened in Uganda and then another that happened in Japan. And so this has become a movement of just creating open spaces and letting the magic happen, letting people inhabit them in creative ways. And you can find out a lot more about this online. Um, so another signal is, um, is me, actually. So uh, the reason I work at the Institute for the Future um, is because of the Global Lives Project. And um, it, I'm going to show you another short video that will tell you more about that. The world is an incredibly diverse place, but it takes experiencing that diversity on a personal level to really appreciate and understand it. The Global Lives Project is a video library of life experience where we record 24 hours in the daily life of people from all walks of life from all over the world. What I think is very interesting is the way in which we present it unraveling in real time, waking up, eating breakfast, conversing with your neighbors. It's those details that really make you connect with someone. All over the world, no matter where we are, how we live, we all laugh, we all cry, we all care about our families. Global Lives cultivates empathy, and empathy is at the foundation of any thriving culture.
It all began with recording the life of James Bullock, a cable car driver here in San Francisco back in 2004. Since then, we've done video shoots in other countries around the world, including Brazil, Malawi, Japan, China, India, Indonesia, Serbia, Lebanon, and Kazakhstan. When selecting our participants, we work with demographics experts to represent the world's diversity by age, religion, income, gender, and occupation. It's really transformative to travel and see other cultures, but not everyone has the privilege to just backpack around the world and get to know people from different places. Global Lives tries to bring that to people where they are, through the internet, through video installations, and allow people to have that experience of seeing what everyday life is like in different places in the world. In a classroom environment, it's very important for the future leaders of this world to be able to appreciate cultures and be able to understand that at the root of it all, we are all human beings with the same aspirations and dreams. The Global Lives Collective is made up of volunteer filmmakers, photographers, designers, architects, and everyday people from all over the world who are dedicated to sharing culture and crossing cultural boundaries. There are so many ways and opportunities to get involved with the Global Lives Project. Even just coming to our website and helping tag videos, there's plenty of opportunities to use our resources, engage in them, and contribute to them. I, um, I started working on the Global Lives Project in 2004, um, and now 11 years later there have been about 2,000 collaborators around the world that have worked on Global Lives. Uh, the, the biggest chunk of those is volunteer translators from all over the world who have translated the now more than 500 hours of, um, of simple footage of daily life of different people. 20 people from 17 different countries have been featured um, in, in our work. And so this, um, when, I, when I met Marina Gorbis, the head of the Institute for the Future, eight years ago, um, I just started talking to her about Global Lives and I gave her um, kind of our, our rudimentary um, slideshow about what I was trying to do. And she stopped me midway through the slideshow and she said, we have to hire you right now. You're exactly what we're talking about, what we're trying to find, what we're studying. And uh, it, was, it was strange for me because going back to where I started um, with Berkeley and activism and Silicon Valley, I just had this idea, you know, if you want to do something, just start doing it and ask people for help and it'll happen. So I, I built this organization um, and, and organization is a stretch. We, we have right now two part-time employees. I'm, I'm one of them. We have a, a tiny little office in San Francisco uh, in the Ninth Street Independent Film Center, which incidentally is a great institution that it makes, makes this possible. Um, but, you know, it's a uh, it's something that has come together that would have probably cost if, if a studio, if a TV studio decided to produce um, 20 different shoots in 17 different countries uh, and, and put it all together and produce video installations, it probably would have cost um, 20 times more than the, the very small amount of money that's gone into Global Lives. Um, so in that, in that sense, we are a case study of, of this social structed organization. Um, and, and it was an accident that I ended up building it that way, but uh, in the years that I've been at the Institute for the Future, it's, it's been really useful to think about. And actually, Marina details the Global Lives Project in the first chapter of, of her book. Um, so the, we, we do exhibits in all different kinds of spaces. This is an exhibit that I just set up um, this week. Uh, actually, we, we, it was built by a group of volunteers at Google, um, and, and they, are, uh, they volunteered to help us implement um, a lot of complex parts of the YouTube, uh, the, the YouTube system for hosting our video. So we've actually got seven terabytes of video hosted on, on YouTube right now. Um, and, uh, and, and then this is, this is the exhibit there. Um, so you know, the Institute for the Future has been doing uh, a lot of research for many years on the this idea of the future of making. Um, so how many of you are familiar with the idea of uh, you know, maker culture or the, the maker fair? Anybody? Okay, I see, I see a lot of hands. Great. So this was actually a map that we did um, all about the future of making. And this, this um, the idea is that uh, makers and the maker mindset are really transforming the idea of how you can make actual physical stuff. Um, has anyone been to a, a tech shop? 
Um, so this, this is a, oh, yes, we have one here. Um, so Tech Shop is, a, is basically a, a gym for nerds who like to make stuff. So it's, it's a gym <laughs> membership model. You pay monthly. And then you get access to um, about, uh, last time I checked, $750,000 worth of very complex machine tools, uh, CNC routers, laser cutters, 3D printers, everything you could want. And you just build lots of stuff. Um, it's, it's a pretty interesting model. Um, Zoo Labs is another, I think, very interesting take on, on music innovation. Um, so this is in, this is actually in Oakland, California, and uh, Zoo Labs basically takes a, uh, a startup venture funding uh, model approach to music and musicians. So they identify emerging musicians, they put them through a boot camp that you, if, you, if it was a startup, you'd call it an accelerator or an incubator program. And at the end of the accelerator, uh, the band or the individual musician records three tracks. And Zoo Labs takes a 10% ownership share, I think that's the right number, um, of, of each of those three tracks, whatever revenue is generated from them. And then they send the musician off to have their career. So this is, this is yet another model of thinking kind of flexibly and thinking about new ways of, of funding and supporting and, and incentivizing artistic production. Um, I mentioned the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts a couple times. Uh, at the Institute, we've um, collaborated with them extensively. Uh, I've been an artist in residence there for the past year um, working on this idea of open cities. And um, this year, they released the uh, Shaping the Future of Market Street, the Urban Prototyping Festival. Did, did anyone happen to catch this? Yes, OK, we've got our very. So um, the idea was, OK, People want to redesign Market Street. People, people want to change the city. Let's let them do it. Let's create a space where people can design um, new sculptures, new street furniture, uh, art installations, and, um, and actually just put it out there for a couple of days. And now um, there are a number of pieces that were successful in this festival that are now up for months and months and months. Oh, yeah. San Francisco. But uh, the Urban Prototyping Festival has been moving around to a lot of different cities. Um, so, and, and they're, yeah. So I don't know if it's happened in New York, but it may have. Um, so the last piece that I wanted to get into here is governance, since this is a meeting about governance. So at the Institute for the Future, uh, a couple of my colleagues and I, a few years ago, started something that we call the Governance Futures Lab. And this is a place where we experiment with and prototype and research new technologies and, and practices of governance. And uh, one of the things that we make at the Institute, which you saw referenced earlier in that video, is um, our, our artifacts from the future. And the idea of this is we think about an, an object or a technology that an archaeologist would find if instead of going to the past, they went to the future. And so this is an example of a, a governance um, artifact from the future that I spent some time developing over the last couple of years. So we call it app for gov um, app for gov is, uh, is a participatory democracy uh, for everyone tool. So the first thing that happens when you start using app for gov uh, is you get a postcard in the mail, and then you scan it. And when you scan the postcard, you see over here, your registration was successful. You're now a confirmed constituent of uh, Barack Obama, Dianne Feinstein, Ed Lee. But then you'll see Dianne Feinstein gets a little star there because she is a committed app for gov user. Um, so what does that mean? That means that Dianne Feinstein has said, as has your city council person, uh, John Smith, that um, they will proactively seek constituent input on as many of their different decisions as they possibly can. And so to, to think this through, I had to come up with uh, this term and this idea, which I call the decision point. And, that, and, and this is relevant to all of you, because all of you are decision makers. And you all, every day in your life, come across probably dozens or even hundreds of different decision points. And Elected officials, um, I think, run into a, a number of categories that are productive to put into a typology. Um, so this this is um, one way that you could uh, you could separate out the different types of decision points that someone like Diane Feinstein would have. Um, and I put them on two axes, going from simple to complex decisions and passive to active decisions. And I think this is really important to all of you because you're all involved in governance decisions in your organizations. And some types of governance decisions lend themselves to um, massive input and technological assistance. Some are harder. So the simple passive ones, vote yes or no on a bill. 
It's simple because there aren't a lot of options, and it's passive because someone gave you the opportunity to make that decision. You didn't have to take any initiative to be able to take that decision. Um, so there are also passive and complex decisions, like how you would edit a 500-page proposed bill. In fact, there are infinite things that you could do to edit a 500-page proposed bill. I see yawns just thinking about editing a 500-page <laughs> proposed bill. Um, so it, yeah, it's, God, well, how would you do that? And much less, how would you get input from thousands of people about how to do that, right? It's challenging. Um, so then there are also simple active decisions like joining a different political party. There's no prescribed day of the week or day of the month or, or, or time of year or even year to switch political parties or to join a political party. So even though this is simple, especially in the United States, um, it's pretty active because you have to take initiative to be able to make that decision. And then there is the, the hardest over here, the active and complex decisions. And uh, one example of this would be creating a comprehensive legislative strategy for something that's not even on the agenda, that's not even being debated right now. Um, it would be extremely difficult to get input from, uh, from constituents on this, but we have a way. Um, so this is Harris Johnson. He's your city council uh, councilman, and he's voting today on whether to ban motor vehicles in the core downtown area. Um, so he wants to know what you think. This is actually a, a um, simple and passive decision that he's making because there's already a proposal on the table. Um, but so you have a choice. You could delegate your vote to an expert or another organization. So you could, you could say, I just want the California Automobile Association to make all my decisions on this topic, um, or the Sierra Club, or the Bike Coalition. Um, you could also say, oh, I'm going to make the decision based on what my friends do. And so 733 of your friends are strongly in favor of this. Um, 22 are not sure, 93 are against. So you could just go with your friends. Um, you could also explain why. And you could have a conversation, or you could ask a question. And again, this is, this is a prototype of how you would interact with um, your city council person. Um, so this um, was another prototype we developed when Google Glass was initially cool. And um, <laughs> so, the, so this is a senator. And, and she is in the US Senate. She's wearing Google Glass. And she is, in real time, seeing tweets that are coming up from her certified constituents. She knows that they're her constituents. And they're watching a live stream of what she's doing in the, in the Senate. And so they're, they're posting here, how does the proposed law restrict tax loopholes? Will correct spending cuts lift the hold on government fund? Uh, right? So this is, this is really interesting. Now, you could imagine if she is from a, a big state, she could have hundreds of tweets per minute. It could get extremely overwhelming. That's why we think that in the future, um, you know, a senator may, may have dozens of staff members. Why not have one of those staff members be a trained community manager? Why not have another one of them be a programmer who can actually make better algorithms to, to filter these different uh, ideas that are coming up? So I wanted to look at other uh, non-political technologies to get inspirations as well for how uh, political technologies and governance technologies could be approved, improved. So I thought Yelp was a really good one. Um, has anyone used this feature? Not, it, it's, a, it's a more advanced Yelp feature to figure out what to actually eat once you're already in the restaurant. I see. What, one or two? OK, so this is a, it's a very simple idea, but I think it's brilliant. It searches all the reviews, and it tells you tempura came up in 160 reviews, agedashi tofu came up in 35 reviews, soba noodles in 35. It's just searching for text strings. It knows not to tell you to eat the, right? Because <laughs> the would come up a lot, and it, was, it takes out the common words. And it just tells you what to eat, right? Amazon.com product reviews. Has anyone ever noticed this feature, the most helpful favorable review and the most helpful critical review? Yeah. So I think this is a brilliant way of, of you know, getting down to the bottom of a conversation that may have thousands of people in it. Um, and you know, Amazon has also these algorithms for figuring out who is most likely to be a most helpful reviewer before they even write a review for something. So Ali Julia is the number one all-time Amazon review writer. Um, and you can see she's got, she's got some fans there. 18 fans, she's 96% helpful, and she's written 2,000, more than 2,000 reviews. Um, so OK Cupid, my last example. So, someone in this room is probably familiar with this. I won't ask you to raise your hand. Um, so this is, this is a dating app that I, I honestly think is light years ahead of our political technologies. And I'm going to explain to you why. Um, so would it bother you to discover a partner likes to cross-dress, yes or no? It doesn't stop there. How would your ideal match answer this question, yes or no? And how important is their answer to you? Imagine if you could express preferences like these when you were deciding who to vote for, right? 
Um, so, and you can do this crazy sorting. You can figure out what are the personality traits that you like of your elected officials, and, I mean, of your uh, potential mates here, um, but uh, you can imagine it for your elected officials, right? And so, the, the idea here could be that if you, if you enter in all these preferences, it could help you figure out who to vote for. It might also tell you that you should um, consider moving to, uh, for me, I think the predictive algorithm was that uh, I need to, if I want to have a better relationship with my elected officials, move to Vermont. Um, so, even though I love California. Um, so, we actually developed um, something that I think could be useful to all of you, our governance design toolkit. And this is a, a toolkit designed to help you design your own governance structures. And this is, this is something if you're rethinking how governance works in your own organization. Um, it's free, it's a PDF you can download from our website. So um, I want to leave a little bit, I think maybe I have a little bit of time to take some questions. Um, thank you all so much for your attention. Do we have time for a couple questions? Yes. I think I see microphones poised behind you. We've got one, oh, oh we've got one there. Yeah, um, I have a comment and a question. I'm Marshall Jones from uh, Crossroads Theater Company. Um, the comment is, since you're in the Silicon Valley, did you have someone invest in that Gov for app? <laughs> um, you know, I spent a little bit of time Thinking about that, actually, um, the, the leadership at the Institute for the Future really wanted me to spin it out and raise a bunch of money and do all of that. And so I, I spent about six months kind of looking into that. The problem is um, I, I already have, so I'm a part-time employee at the Institute for the Future. Um, I also run the Global Lives Project, those, those 2,000 volunteers around the world that I mentioned. Um, and, and right now I'm also teaching at Berkeley. And so uh, I, ha I was a little bit, I think, too busy to start something else. Um, and I, I kind of, after about six months of thinking about it, realized that um, you, you really need someone who can work like 100 hours a week to get something like that off the ground. Um, so I, I kept it as I had initially designed it as a artifact from the future, as a thought experiment. But right now we actually, um, I've also tried to channel all of my learnings about this into two nonprofit organizations that are doing similar things that I think are awesome. Um, one of them is called Democracy OS, and it's started by a group from Argentina. Um, we, we invited one of their founders to be a fellow at the Institute for the Future. Her name is Pia Mancini, and uh, you should watch her TED Talk, Pia Mancini, again, uh, and about Democracy OS. The other that I think is really interesting that actually could be useful in a theater organization um, is called Lumio. And it's a really simple online tool for making decisions um, as, as a group. So I spent a little time. I, I, you know, I got to the point where people told me I'd need to raise a couple million dollars to create a functional prototype of that stuff. And um, I think also like trying to raise money for more than one thing at a time is like, it's like fighting a war on two fronts and should never be done by any sane human being. Um, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, the other tool that I think could be useful to you is Lumio, L-O-O-M-I-O. -O -O I think we had a question up here in the front. Can you elaborate on what Lumio is? Oh, yeah, so Lumio, um, it's, it's like so simple, but it's genius. You need to make a decision. Um, maybe it's a binary decision. Maybe there are three or four or ten options. Um, you post that as a question. And people go onto the, onto the site and they vote. They pick which option and then they explain why. It has a very simple but elegant comment thread where people explain why they're voting for each thing. And it shows a, a pie chart of who voted for what. You can set a timeline, the, de the deadline to vote on things. And then you have a really clear record of why people wanted what at the end of it. So you could open it up just to your board members if you need to have a conversation between meetings. You could open it up to all of your constituents. It's, uh, it's very popular within uh, a lot of cooperatives um, that are like worker-owned cooperatives. Cooperatives, uh, and it's being used inside of a lot of nonprofit organizations, uh, and they also have kind of pol political aspirations for it. Eventually, it's it's built by a team out of New Zealand. Yeah, oh, yeah, please. Uh, can you share with us any uh, particularly interesting innovations I, uh, for that the, the trustee level, either with the institute or with your Global Lives Project, that that you've been able to implement? Sorry. Uh, In terms of uh, the board governance part, uh, you showed us the spiral. I think that mainly yeah. applied to staff. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, that's really interesting. So at the, for the Global Lives Project, um, I, I made what a lot of people probably interpreted as a mistake by asking all of my 20-something closest friends to be my board members when I started the organization at age 25. Um, and, and none of them, um, well, there was one who, who got some checks written, um, but none of the others really could get checks written and do any of that. But the board members ended up being um, basically the staff of the organization. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with organizations like that. But then some of them actually became volunteer managers and helped develop a whole strategy for how to mobilize volunteers. And some of the most um, amazing things came out of that. And uh, you know, board members ended up bringing on, um, we had one board member who got a team of Stanford students to write a curriculum for using the Global Lives videos to teach oh. empathy in grades six through 12 in classrooms. And it was a, it was a team of Stanford graduate students of, in the education school. So like board members um, going out and thinking about how they can leverage not just um, their dollars or their friends' dollars or their friends' 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 dollars, um, but thinking about how to use leverage talent. Also, uh, a lot of them have been really successful in leveraging uh, pro bono projects for us from, from different companies in Silicon Valley. Um, so, I th you know, I think that's, that's one direction. Um, I think also, I've seen more and more creative ways of involving um, not just staff input um, but also constituent input into the board. So we, we do, I'm sure a lot of you do this, um, excuse me, but uh, I think you, you could think about ways of, like I said, using a tool like Lumio to get sort of systematic and regular feedback from your members or from your, from your supporters. Those are a few ideas, yeah. I see a hand over here. I think that's all the time oh, we have for time questions. Have. Okay. But right. feel free to approach David afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.